Good evening. My name is Larry Cimino, and I'm the president of the Indiana Council on World Affairs. And it's my pleasure at this time to introduce our moderator for this evening, who will in turn introduce Ambassador Carol Perez, our distinguished speaker. Jillian Foster Turner is a member of our ICWA Board of Directors. She joined the Indiana Economic Development Corporation as the Director of International Programs in 2019. And she focuses on economic development and strengthening Indiana's international engagement. Jillian herself worked for seven years at the US Department of State, including as the Secretary of State's Public Affairs Advance Lead, where she communicated US foreign policy objectives globally. Additionally, Jillian advised Bureau leadership on policy and strategic planning initiatives and managed Fulbright, Fulbright programs throughout South and Central Asia. She holds a BA in International Studies from Indiana University and a Master's of Education from Harvard University. Jillian is originally from Shelbyville, Indiana. So on behalf of ICWA, I welcome all of you to this evening's program and I turn this over now to Jillian Turner. Thank you so much, Larry. I appreciate it and welcome to all of our guests. We are so delighted to have you here as part of this conversation. Um, perhaps while we wait a couple of minutes for Ambassador Perez to be connected, um, I'm going to uh, take pride of place and wonder if we can pose a question or two um, to Lou. I'm sure our students would, especially the students, would love to hear a little bit more about the makeup of the State Department. Um, you mentioned a number of different types of employees, foreign service officers, um, civil servants, which is what I was. Um, I think many people would be surprised to know that most department employees are actually foreign service nationals um, that are working at our embassies all throughout the world. So I um, was wondering, Lou, if you would share a little bit about the makeup of the department and how those different employees work together to inform policy. Sure. Uh, thanks, Jillian. Uh, a very good question. Actually, the bulk of uh, our employees are foreign service nationals. So uh, these are people who work in our embassies, our missions, our consulates overseas, and they are the, the institutional knowledge, the continuity. As foreign service officers, we move around every two to three years. We're in a different embassy, a different country. Sometimes we're in Washington or doing a domestic assignment like this one, but our foreign service employees, our, our local employees really dedicate their lives to working for the US government. And for many of them, it's because they believe in, in the values that we believe in uh, for their country, for the country they live in. So we have about 50,000 local nationals that work for the, uh, for the State Department. We have about 7,000, 7 to 8,000 foreign service officers, and these are foreign service general, generalists like me, or foreign service specialists. Our foreign service specialists are doctors, nurses, IT specialists, office management specialists, uh, people who have technical knowledge or technical skill that's required to actually run an embassy. Uh, which is, is very much like a, a small city. Uh, and then we have about 20, 25,000 civil servants. Our civil servants are based domestically, although they do travel quite a bit. We, we are a foreign policy agency, a, a foreign facing agency. And so most of our work takes place at our headquarters in Washington and overseas. So our civil servants uh, are positioned in place. They uh, are usually in one position. Uh, for their careers, or they might move to a second or a third position over the course of their careers. And likewise, like our foreign service nationals, our local nationals, they provide institutional knowledge and continuity as we, the foreign service officers, move around. But we all really uh, work as a team, uh, whether you're in Washington or overseas or domestic uh, here and, and in practice, really, uh, you never know if someone is a civil servant or a foreign service officer. Uh, you know, we, we all sort of work together and, uh, and, and just blend in together as a Hi, uh, Larry here. Um, we have Lou speaking now. Were you able to find another computer or? Oh, Larry, you're not muted. Sorry, go ahead, Lou. Adi Bolin, will you unmute Lou, please? Thank you. There we go. Thanks. Thanks. Yeah. yeah. Well, that's uh, that's I think uh, a good kind of summary 
uh, of how we're structured in, in terms of employees, but uh, happy to take any other questions anyone has while we're waiting for Ambassador Perez. You, you mentioned um, the Foreign Service Generalists. Um, with so many complex pressing issues happening around the world, um, where you know technical expertise is required, um, really complex uh, discussions and, and challenges. Why does the State Department still prioritize the generalist um, and that kind of role and structure within the Foreign Service? So again, you know, a really good question. Um, Foreign Service generalists, um, a, as a generalist, and, and we are in one of five career tracks, by the way, so public diplomacy, management, consular affairs, political, or econ. Each of us is in one of those career tracks, and I'm a public diplomacy officer. Um, we represent the United States, and we come into the Foreign Service really from any sort of academic or professional background. You can uh, apply to the Foreign Service until you're 59 and a half. You have to be uh, under 59 and a half when you onboard. And we do get people uh, who do come into the Foreign Service for a second career or a third career. In my case, this is a third career for me. Uh, I came in, uh, you know, in my 40s. So that's relatively common. The average age is about 35. But to circle back to your original question, uh, because we come from really a wide range of backgrounds, performing arts to music, to history, to international affairs, um, the process uh, in which we come into the Foreign Service starts with a test. Uh, so it's kind of a leveling of the playing field. The process evaluates who you are as a person. Uh, so it looks at your personal qualities, things like cultural adaptability and leadership, uh, and so on, uh, and also your motivation. So why do you want to be a foreign service officer? Why do you want to be a public servant? Because that's uh, what we all of us are. Uh, we, we serve you, we serve the American people, uh, and, uh, and we serve really uh, uh, the country when we're overseas, just, just like the military who we often work really closely with. So, um, so, so as a generalist, you learn, we give uh, you the training you need to be uh, a public diplomacy officer or a counselor officer uh, or a management officer. Uh, all of that is provided to you. And when you're serving overseas, you, you get a lot of continuing training and mentorship uh, from the people that you work with. So, so if you're interested in the Foreign Service, um, you know, don't think that you have to have a foreign language or a lot of uh, international travel. Of course, those things are helpful, uh, but they're, they're not required. What's more important is your motivation uh, and also the personal qualities that you bring to the table. And in, in the, I'm sure many of the, the students will be interested to hear a little bit more about fellowship programs. Um, several of the fellowship programs that are kind of entry pass to the Foreign Service, thinking of the Pickering Fellowship, for example, um, attract students to careers at the department when they're quite young, perhaps 19 or 20 years old, um, and line them up for a career at the State Department, um, decades long. And as you mentioned, you've had several careers before joining the Foreign Service. Um, I'm in my early 30s and I've already had a couple careers. Um, is it uh, still the strategy of the department of a modern department to focus on students at a young age um, in the hopes that they stay for the duration of their career at the department? Um, do you still see value in programs and kind of that traditional onboarding um, when, when folks are earlier in their career, perhaps still in college? Sure, I, you know, another great question. Uh, and, and the answer is both. Uh, so we focus on mid-career professionals. Uh, the average age of an incoming Foreign Service officer is 35 uh, right now, and it seems to be sort of creeping upward. Uh, but we also bring Foreign Service officers in right out of undergrad. Uh, and we have several different kinds of programs, especially our internship programs, which are quite popular. Some of them are unpaid, some are paid, some are for undergrads, some are for grads, some are domestic, some are overseas. So a real wide kind of variety. 
um, people do come in right out of undergrad. People come in through our programs like uh, the Pickering Wrangle program, uh, one of uh, the programs that tries to foster foster diversity within the department. We define diversity quite broadly in the State Department. So uh, in addition to race, ethnicity, gender, geography uh, is another diversity factor that we look at. Socioeconomic status is another. Pickering Wrangle is a two-year program uh, that results in a full-time foreign service uh, position at the end of the program. So it's direct entry into the foreign service without having to go through the normal foreign service process, registering for the test, taking the test, uh, and then moving through the other steps in the process. Um, so we tried to uh, we tried to foster uh, interest quite early on. Uh, in I know here uh, in in Michigan, you know, I, uh, pre COVID, I traveled quite a bit down to IU Bloomington, you know, to Notre Dame, uh, Southern Indiana, IUPUI, uh, and do now virtual events with them. Uh, unfortunately, you know, it's not the same as as kind of the in person uh, events that that we we really like to do. Uh, but you know, uh, we we do we are are still able to reach uh, a lot of uh, interested students uh, for our programs. I'll also put in the chat box our central careers portal. So uh, if you surf to careers.state.gov, you'll see that portal is divided into student programs and career programs has a lot of very, very detailed information on both uh, different kinds of programs, how to apply, eligibility requirements, the process, uh, and so on. So uh, I'm also a, a resource for you. Um, I talk to students all the time. So, so please feel free to reach out to me if you need help navigating some of these programs or you have questions about how to apply. Wonderful. And you, because you mentioned diversity, um, just about an hour ago, um, there was an announcement that came out that President Biden was going to nominate several uh, senior members of the State Department. Many of them were um, hitting on some of those diversity points, the kind of um, you know, race, ethnicity from different parts of the country that you had mentioned. Can you share a little bit about efforts underway at the department um, to expand diversity, to be more reflective of the country, of the United States, um, and, and how that kind of works in the Foreign Service in um, a process where it is a bit time served to move through um, versus some of the other parts of the department. I think we have the ambassador on uh, now. At least she said she was on. So, <laughs> Ambassador Perez, are you there? Oh no, she's calling me back. Hang on, sorry. I'll mute again. So Lou, back to you. So you Adibola, would you please unmute Lou? So, okay. so so sure. Uh, thanks, Jillian. You know, as you mentioned, uh, diversity um, is very important, uh, especially when you're overseas representing the United States. The, the department places a really high uh, premium on, on us representing the U.S. So when you're overseas, you know, you, you interact with lots of different kinds of people. Many of them have never met an American or certainly uh, not spent a lot of time with an American in, in many, uh, certainly a lot of the places I've been, you know, Afghanistan, Iraq, um, Yemen, uh, Kosovo. Uh, I, I very frequently ran into people who had met Americans in passing, uh, but never really got to know them, you know, or, or developed really friendships or relationships with them. So it's really important that, that we bring our personal experience to the table when we're overseas and that we can relate to different kinds of people, the different kinds of people we meet. The department um, is, is very laser focused on diversity and making sure that the ranks of the Foreign Service and the Civil Service reflect the America, reflect the United States. We have a number of different programs. Pickering Wrangle is one. Uh, we have several initiatives that take place during uh, heritage months. For example, this is Arab American Heritage Month. 
Uh, and I'm doing a number of events uh, in and around metropolitan Detroit, where there's a very large Arab American community, and also really in the region, Indianapolis, Columbus, um, you know, our, uh, those schools in those uh, cities are also invited, Cleveland, Cincinnati. Um, so we try to mark and, and use these heritage months as a springboard for our recruitment efforts. In addition to that, we have a strong liaison to minority serving institutions, MSIs, which is a Department of Education designation for HBCUs, uh, uh, historically black colleges and universities. Uh, we, we maintain a direct link, a liaison with those as DIRs, and we have recruiters in the department who likewise maintain a direct uh, liaison, a direct link uh, to them as well. In addition to that, we work with several other programs uh, through our educational and cultural affairs where, where uh, Jillian, where you, you work. Yeah. Um, that I actually work a great deal with high school students in exchange type programs or language uh, scholarship programs like our critical language scholarship. And very often those students go on to do an internship and then a fellowship and then the foreign service. And so they take one kind of experience and build on it. And we try to help them along through that process. Uh, but when we work with applicants, you know, we work with all applicants. I mean, if you're interested in the civil service, we're interested, or, or the foreign service, we're interested in you. We want to work with you and and help you get where you want to be. But um, but just to circle back, diversity is very important, and as as I said before, uh, that includes lots of different kinds of factors, including geography, including socioeconomic status, and and sometimes uh, people who really exhibit sort of multiple uh, elements of diversity when they apply. Wonderful. Thank you so much for sharing your perspective and expertise with us. Um, and I think, Larry, I got a thumbs up. Um, do we have Ambassador yes. Perez with us? I, yes, I believe. <laughs> um, Ambassador I am Perez, here. Were you Thank able you so much. <laughs> there we are. Okay. <laughs> finally, finally. Yeah. Wonderful. Well, Go ahead, uh, uh, Jillian. I think you should introduce Ambassador Perez now. <laughs> and, Perfect. Uh, and we can take over. I'm delighted to. Well, thank you so much, Acting Under Secretary Perez, for joining us, for persevering. Um, apologies. <laughs> we would love to have you in person in Indianapolis um, and not having to, to navigate all these uh, technical challenges. So thank you, thank you, thank you for um, sticking with us. And we're delighted to have you here. Um, I would be honored to introduce you. So um, Carol Z. Perez is the Acting Undersecretary for um, the State Department for Management. As Acting Undersecretary for Management, she's responsible for people, resources, budget, facilities, technology, financial operations, counselor affairs, logistics, contracting, and security for the department. Um, <laughs> so a little bit busy as the Secretary's Principal Advisor on Management Issues. Ambassador Perez is a career member of the Foreign Service, class of Minister Counselor, and in this capacity, she's provided strategic leadership and guidance to the Secretary and Department leaders on talent management issues that affect our global workforce of over 76,000 State Department employees. Since joining the Foreign Service in 1987, she has held many distinguished positions, including as U.S. Ambassador to Chile. And we are in for a real treat because she is also a Midwesterner. Um, yes. Ambassador Perez is a native of Cleveland, Ohio. She has a BA from Hiram College in Political Science and an MA in Healthcare Administration from the George Washington University. Please join me in welcoming Ambassador Perez. Thank you, Jillian. Thank you so much. I do apologize. So one of the things that really hasn't changed during the pandemic, uh, besides the fact that we can't see each other in person, is our tech challenges. Uh, at one point, and you'll appreciate this, all of you, I had three devices open. I had my <laughs> iPhone, my iPad, and the computer I never used that sits in another room as I tried to figure out how to get in, but I'm so thankful we were really, really able to do it. Uh, and of course, I think that's probably a good place to start because I think the timing of tonight's event is quite auspicious. I think the pandemic has shown us that a gener new generation of Americans that government matters mm -hmm. and that public service really does make a difference. So I'm really excited to be here to talk to you about what that means as we 
try to renew awareness about who we are as an institution and recruit for the next uh, generation of diplomats and public servants and really engage with the American people um, because we can't do this unless we have the best people in the jobs. And as you mentioned, I am a, I'm a Clevelander. I'm a big Browns fan. She, I, I know I can't, you know, the whole Indianapolis Colts thing, I'm still in a little PTSD over that, but it's okay after so many years. But I'm really glad. I love to come back to the Midwest, even if it's virtually and have a chance to talk to people. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much for joining um, and, and sharing your perspective. Um, really looking forward to tonight's discussion. If you don't mind, we'll, we'll jump right in. Perfect. Thank you. So a stereotype of the Foreign Service is often male, pale, and Yale um, is what people think a Foreign Service officer, a diplomat, um, an American diplomat means. As a woman from the Midwest, you don't fit that model. Um, so would you share a little bit about what attracted you to the Foreign Service and how your career has unfolded and progressed over many decades of public service? Yeah, I, I think I would say that I am a little bit of an accidental diplomat. I, um, as I said, I grew up in Cleveland. I grew up, by the way, in a very middle class family. I went to a small college where um, nobody talked about the State Department in any serious way. I mean, we obviously, I mean, I was a political science major, but I was actually more interested at that time in US political science and so in how government worked and, and obviously the political specter, not so much on the foreign policy side. So I, I actually got here because my husband joined the Foreign Service. So I moved to Washington DC, went to graduate school, uh, got married and my husband came home one day and said, oh, I, I took an exam and I passed. What do you think about moving overseas? And I said, well, that sounds great. Um, and uh, I was working at the time, but I also had just had a child and I thought this is a great time to take a break. And we moved to Montevideo, Uruguay, which in 1987 was about the end of the world. Uh, it took us four flights and about two and a half days to get there. Uh, but it was the start of an incredible journey for both of us. And I ended up doing work as a family member. That's something I'd love to talk about because it is tough, especially nowadays. You know, um, the one thing I would say, and you know this, Jillian, the State Department is just filled with really smart people who tend to have partners that are really smart, you know, spouses mm -hmm. and partners. So there's a bit of frustration, but I started working in a variety of jobs inside the embassy and eventually took the exam and, and passed. Um, my husband and I raised three children in the Foreign Service, so yes, it is possible to do so. Um, I, ironically, not one of them has any interest in doing what I did for a living. They're very <laughs> happy living in Washington, D.C., that will never leave. But, you know, we really had an incredible experience in life together overseas. And I would say that over 30 years, um, by the way, I selected to be a management code officer. I know that um, for the students or the, peop the, the people in the room that are thinking about joining, I think everybody thinks political officer, road to the top, that's the brass ring to be an ambassador. And I try not to think of myself as a unicorn. I selected management because I came out of healthcare administration and I knew that for me personally, I needed to see results and I needed to have the ability to impact in um, programs and projects and not have to wait for 10 or 15 years to see if they actually succeeded or not. So I selected that. But I also, because of that, I think I had some interesting opportunities to do work that perhaps others did not. And I would say um, I've had many, many incredible positions over the years, but I worked on the staffs of three secretaries of state. So secretaries Albright, Powell and Rice, and I'd be happy to talk later about what it was like to work with them. Um, and also to, as I said, I've, I was ambassador to Chile and then just prior to this current position where I am acting, I was the Director General of the Foreign Service for uh, two years. And it's an incredibly important position because we are really, that is where the rubber hits the roads in terms of strengthening us as an institution. And it was an incredible experience uh, to have that opportunity to do so. Building on, on your latest point, you know, with Oh, and Lou and I spoke about this a little bit before you joined about um, President Biden's announcement today of some um, new appointments and, and positions at the department, um, senior people who reflect the diversity of, of our great country um, and what that means. But currently, I believe there are only four or five African-American ambassadors um, 
So can you talk a little bit about the importance of not only recruiting, but retaining the people yes. that reflect the diversity and what, um, why it's in America's interest that our State Department and our civil service reflect our country? Yeah, and by the way, I'm so glad you mentioned civil service. You were a civil servant, and I don't want this conversation just to be about the Foreign Service, because we are actually a very, very broad organization with many different kinds of employees, and so it's important that we remember that because we work together. So to your point, recruitment is obviously very important, and I can talk about recruitment quite a bit, but the retention piece is probably where really where, the, where uh, we, we need to make sure that we're doing the best we can. Um, one of the things that I, I focused on when I was the director general was uh, creating a culture of inclusion and respect. Because I, I, when I came back from overseas, um, from being in Chile, um, and I got back to the department, what, one of the things that struck me is that we, um, we have a really tough life and we ask our, 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 our diplomats to serve in very austere locations. Many people today are separated from their families. I think everybody thinks of the military having to go through this. Um, many of the military, obviously military families are separated and they serve also in very, very difficult places in war zones. But the Foreign Service does the same thing. And unlike the military, we're not in bases. We may be off in an embassy in a very remote area. Um, we may be at a consulate. We may be in a, what we call an American presence post where people might be alone or just with one or two where you can't take your families. Um, and so one of the things I wanted to do was to take a look at the kinds of incentives we might offer people. So I focused a lot on, uh, you know, are, are we making sure that we have the flexibilities in place? Uh, you know, do we, do we make sure that people can balance family life and work? And I know as a parent, that was really important to me during my career. And I, to be perfectly frank, it was of a certain age where nobody cared about that, right? That was mm -hmm. just not something to be done. Um, and, and as I said, underlying all this was this idea of inclusion and respect, because I think if we don't have respect for each other, then we obviously don't have a culture of inclusion, which means if you look different or you are different in some way, you're not going to stay because you're not going to feel that you are valued, that your, uh, your opinions are valued, that you have any worth to the organization. So I used to, I said, you know, if we can help change culture, which is very, very hard, then I think we will have better diversity. Because if you feel, again, that you make a difference, that you're at the table, that your voice is heard, then I believe we will keep people. So we did, we did a lot of work on making that a priority. And when I came into that bureau, that was a priority for us from, from the beginning. The other piece of that, as I said, is just to make sure that we take care of our people. Uh, and, and Secretary Blinken and President Biden both believe in this. If you remember, President uh, Biden came to the department. His first visit to another cabinet agency was to the State Department. And he gave a great speech about how important diplomacy is. And he thanked us. Mm -hmm. And that goes a long way because it, it helps to remind people that, yes, it's not always the military. And again, I, they do an incredible job. But there are so many other people that live and work overseas that support the American people every day. And I would also acknowledge we have colleagues from other agencies such as Department of Justice and Homeland Security um, and Health and Human Services, CDC is overseas. All of these people work together to support the American people. And we just need to make sure that we give them the tools and the, uh, the support so that they are resilient and they can do their jobs. Building off of um, what you were talking about with Secretary um, Blinken and, and President Biden going to the department and um, reminding the department that they are an important part in, in moving things forward. Um, Secretary Blinken promised that we would have a foreign policy for the middle class. And I know we spoke previously um, about this, how important it is for people to understand, for Midwesterners to understand that every day, diplomats, people at the State Department are going to work for them, thinking about what benefits um, America. What does it mean to have a foreign policy um, that's focused on the middle class? What does that mean for American workers? What does that mean for American families? So we did talk about this. I don't know, Jillian and I were saying when I would go home to Ohio or my, my to, to Illinois where I now have family, we seem to have st skipped over the state of Indiana in the, in the process. You know, people, the first question often be, I'd say, oh, I work at the State Department. They say, oh, what state is that? And I'd say, no, no, actually, the real, the Foreign Service State Department in Washington, D.C. 
And, and I talked a little bit about how we have to make investments in our people, right? We have to put our people first. We have to give them what I need. But I think it's always important to remember, why are we doing that? Why, why are we really um, investing in a department? What does that mean? Well, we're really doing that because we want to safeguard our lives and our livelihoods for all Americans. And I, I believe that our diplomats overseas in Washington are always having the interests of Americans at home. So I think that what the change has been, the president and the secretary have really pushed us to say, uh, to make sure that when we say we are promoting American interests, that it really means all Americans. Um, as I mentioned, I grew up in a very middle-class family. So, you know, I really, this really resonates with me. I didn't come from a, uh, um, you know, from a privileged background. And so um, when I wake up in the morning, I have a good sense of what I'm doing to help the American people. And I can give you an example of what we would do in Chile, for example. So I think everybody thinks where they're negotiating treaties on weapons of mass destruction and working to counter terrorism, which we do. Mm -hmm. But a lot of what I did was to help uh, have trade, foreign and direct investment come to the United States or try to support the exports of small and medium enterprises into new markets in Chile. We did a lot of work with agricultural products, in fact. there's a, uh, Chile and the U.S. have a free trade agreement, and because we have the opposite seasons, it's amazing the number of U.S. agricultural products that come to Chile, and we spent a lot of time promoting this. Because the more we can do that, obviously, the better for America. And this is not just about people living on the East or West Coast. These are people like me who grew up in the Midwest and are trying to figure out what does this mean? Um, I, this is just an anecdote, but one of the, um, Chile is obviously one of the countries with the most amount of copper in the world. And you may have seen, there was a very famous movie that was made about the, uh, about the miners got stuck under, under, under the earth. And if I recall, I believe it was a company from Indiana that mm -hmm. had designed the drill bits that were able to go as deep as they were to provide air and then eventually water so that they could eventually rescue those miners. So we did a lot of work with all of the fears and I would meet hundreds and hundreds of small businesses who, which who the Chilean companies were delighted to have partnerships with. Why? Because Americans are incredibly creative and innovative. Uh, we know how to do work. We know how to do it well. We do it at a competitive price. And they knew the quality of what we were going to do was really important. And, and I talk about that because there's always a lot of talk about China. You know, the one thing I could always say to my interlocutors, if you get something from the United States, they will stand by the product. It's going to be first rate. It's going to be first class. So these are the kinds of things that we think about. How can we go ahead and touch everybody? And, and, and as I said, you know, that's one example. Another one would be though, and I'm sure that this, this um, World Affairs Council does this, we bring a lot of international visitors to the United States, although in this, not during COVID, but we did prior to COVID. And where do we send them? We don't send them to New York City, Miami. We send them to places that they wouldn't otherwise visit. So mm -hmm. we might send them maybe not even to Indianapolis, which is quite large, but maybe to a smaller city. We might send them to Columbus or we might send them to you know, Peoria, Illinois, but to give them a sense of who we are as Americans and how important it is to see our diversity, you know, how, what we are like and how we operate in the, you know, the 50 wonderful federal straight states that we are. With thinking right now about, I work in economic development for the state of Indiana. We're very proud to have over a thousand foreign owned operations in our state. Um, and a challenge we've really had in the past year as we've all tried to navigate COVID and travel restrictions and visa restrictions and all of that um, is to maintain those connections, is to understand that um, this isn't just an economic relationship, that this is a relationship across educational lines and cultural lines, and that also is important to our communities. Um, and when I was at the department, I worked on access to education in Afghanistan. And some of my wonderful family and friends in Indiana would say, why are we focused on educating Afghans when we have so many problems in America? Um, and I think a lot of Americans are feeling that really strongly now, that mm -hmm. kind of, whether it's access to a COVID vaccine or whether it's economic recovery efforts. So how do you marshal support for outward looking initiatives when so many Americans feel left behind or at least let me catch my breath? 
you know, um, that is, it, it, this is such a great question, but I think that when we start thinking about this pandemic, um, the pandemic has no borders. And so uh, one of the challenges actually, and I'm sure you're all aware, is that as frustrating as the vaccine rollout has been in the United States, and I know it's been very frustrating, we are way ahead of the rest of the world. We are vaccinating at a far greater rate than anybody else. So the fear continues to be, what happens if the United States gets vaccinated, but we don't take care of Mexico and Canada? Because the border, the virus doesn't say, oh, I've got the real Grande River, I'm, I'm not gonna go any further. No, it's gonna jump. And I think it's shown us that we are way too interconnected today. Everything is very, very interconnected that we really need to think not only about you know, what we need here, but also overseas. I, you make a good point though, that as, as, we, as we consider what our priority is gonna be, it's important to remember to go back. We are here because we are here to, as I said, represent the American people, no matter what that might be. And I think that the department is well positioned to do that on an everyday basis. Um, I think people think uh, when they travel, they might think about counselor services. And if you get in trouble, we'll take care of you. Get sick, we take, we help you with that. Um, we, get, we obviously, we, get, we do the passports, we do visas. But again, um, we do so much more. And I, all I would say is it's a little bit hard in this day and age uh, to, to actually try to, you know, consider that there might be a wall. You can put a you can put a physical wall up, but a virus is going to hop over it. Right. Uh, and I think that's uh, that's really um, something that we need to consider. And talking about kind of uh, taking down walls and and the interconnected reality of the world right now. Um, Connecting to foreign interlocutors is key in moving so many of our positions forward for our diplomats around the world. Um, there's been a shift um, for some of our adversaries to moving more towards transactional model of collaboration mm -hmm. um, where there aren't expectations around human rights or other democratic principles um, that American diplomats hold and that are conditions for engagement oftentimes. Um, can you talk a little bit about that challenge for our diplomats and how, if there's training, any kind of resources at the department to help kind of navigate that? Um, is it a situation where you uh, have to pivot and, and change the way that we in interact in some countries? Um, can you speak a little bit about how, how the department's handling that? Sure, uh, you're absolutely right. I mean, the transactional model for some of our adversaries is present today, but I would argue that it's been there at least uh, probably from antiquity to the middle of the 20th, 20th century. So it's not something that's necessarily new. I mean, I would think that it was not until after World War II, I, and that was with the establishment of the United Nations. Uh, that's when we had the Universal Declaration on Human Rights that there are efforts to promote democracy, and this is in the context of the Cold War and beyond, really became a principle that I think we take for granted nowadays. Because, you know, again, this was something that was just not discussed, you know, back at that back in that time. So we do face competitors who aren't are, you know, unconstrained from the kinds of principles that we uphold. So I think it uh, makes an even stronger case that the diplomats, um, you know, we have to make the case for the benefits of democratic governance. I mean, we have to really talk about an enlightened self-interest for them and that it's every nation's responsibility to uphold human rights. Um, it is hard. We do give our diplomats tools. Uh, our training has you know, shifted over time and uh, we are actually, you know, we need to take a more global approach to how we consider these. But I would ultimately say that transactions uh, and that model is only one part of the diplomatic toolkit. Uh, we, you know, it's often, we, we sometimes have to go there, but often, you know, you look at what's more important, it's partnership, mm. or it's working together on a regional basis. It's trying to find like-minded partners. Sometimes they're not the obvious ones, by the way. Uh, there, I did a lot of this in Chile, where I would look for um, people who shared uh, common objectives. Sometimes they were personal objectives. Something was, times it was the, the, the ambassador in a country who would perhaps was supportive, but had to convince you know, the capital to go there. And let me give you a great example. 
So when I was in Chile, I was the first female um, U.S. ambassador to Chile, and it took 200 plus years. It finally happened. So um, it, in the International Women's Day overseas is a big, big event. I know it's not celebrated quite so much in the United States, but when you are overseas, this is a, uh, it's March 8th, and it's an opportunity to really recognize what women have done globally. I worked with a wonderful group of female ambassadors in Chile. In fact, at one point, we had about 18 out of the diplomatic corps. And we decided as a group, we were going to go together and do a couple of things. One, we were going to draft an op-ed that would be placed in the largest newspaper that would talk about women's rights globally. And then we had a couple other events we were doing with, they have a ministry for women and children in Chile, which obviously we don't have here. So I was, I volunteered myself to be on the small committee that was going to draft this. And on the committee with me were the Polish ambassador um, the, and the Nicaraguan ambassador. Now, Nicaragua and the United States don't have a whole lot in common, never have, uh, at least recently. And yet I was able to forge a wonderful relationship with this ambassador over a common goal if she personally was a great advocate for women's rights. This text had to go back to capitals for approval, but mm -hmm. we got through, we made it happen. So I think sometimes you just have to find that point of passion with somebody. And that is something that you can then move forward together. And um, she was somebody that when she first met me, it was a bit hands off, you know, when we think about it, you know, she was very close to the Cuban ambassador and the Venezuelan ambassador. This was sort of her, her little group because obviously they shared a political, um, uh, you know, program that was different than what the United States and the Canadians and others would, or the, the UK would be thinking about, but we did find commonality. So it gets back to, yes, it can be transactional, but obviously partnership is a far better way to go. Uh, speaking, continuing the, the thread around alliances and partnerships, um, just yesterday, Secretary Blinken um, stood beside the U.S. Secretary of Defense, Austin, but perhaps more notably, the NATO Secretary um, General Stolenberg in Brussels, shortly after President Obama, or sorry, President Biden announced that the U.S. would be withdrawing troops from Afghanistan. He talked about Article 5, our shared defense, um, which NATO invoked for the first time 20 years ago to come mm -hmm. to America's defense after 9-11. Mm -hmm. um, and he said, we went into Afghanistan together as an alliance, we will go out of Afghanistan together as an alliance. What does it say about President Biden's thinking and Secretary Blinken's thinking around alliances that Secretary Blinken wasn't standing beside President Biden as this announcement was made, he was standing beside our NATO ally. Well, and, I, and again, I think that's a very powerful reminder, Jillian, of, you know, when did this first start? When was that Article 5 first invoked? And it was after 9-11. Um, I'm actually working right now on an Afghanistan issues, so I spent a lot of time in meetings today. And um, what I can tell you is that, uh, you know, this is not only at headquarters where there's obviously this public commitment to this, it happens on the ground. Um, I was in a conversation with our current charge in Afghanistan just last week, who said that, who does he work with? He works with the Germans and the Italians and the Brits and the Turks. So there is a sheer commitment to these. And I think, again, when I think of the complexity of the issues we face today, we can't get by without it. And, and I, I'm a longtime diplomat. This is a far more complicated world than it was in 1987 when I joined. The issues are, are, are transcendental, whether or not, again, it's a pandemic or Afghanistan or um, artificial intelligence or cybersecurity. I mean, there's just so many things that have touched so many countries. So when we stand together. Um, I think that we do, you know, we do better. And, and I'm so appreciative of the fact that the secretary took the time to go personally to Brussels to stand there in a sign of, you know, a sign of, of um, support and partnership with NATO. But I can tell you, it trickles all the way down. And as I said, our acting ambassador in Afghanistan right now has told me he's doing the same thing. So there's no difference between what's happening at the top and what's happening in the field. I remember a, a couple of years ago when the State Department budget um, was being threatened um, the person who came out strongest in support of it was then Defense Secretary Mattis. Mm -hmm. And um, currently the U.S. spends about $700 billion annually on defense and about $55 billion combined the State Department, USAID, and foreign assistance. Um, do you see that changing moving forward? And what does that say 
about America's priorities and strategy for international engagement? Well, I, I first believe the defense budget um, increase has really started after 9-11. I think that's when it first became apparent that we needed to have a stronger military uh, presence and response in the United States. If you remember, we also though have been in Afghanistan and Iraq for many, many years with significant military presence as well. Uh, and you know we've used our, our forces uh, also in this new era of global competition. So if you think about other parts of the world, um, but I do think it's, you know, the president and the secretary have been very clear that, you know, diplomacy, once again, is going to be the centerpiece of American foreign policy. As I said, the president came to the State Department for the first cabinet agency that he visited. He wants us to be a leader. I remember very much uh, Secretary Mattis's statement. And the good news is that uh, already in this president's 2022 discretionary budget, which was just announced last week, we um, hopefully will receive a 12, he's suggesting a 12% increase over what we had last year. And I, it's gonna take time. Um, mm -hmm. Funds are not unlimited. Uh, our budget is still relatively small, but it, this is again, 12%, about $6.8 billion over what we had in 2021. So I think the rebalancing is starting. It's, you know, it will take time. We are a much smaller agency. We will never need what the DOD needs, nor should we. But I do think that we can properly reinforce each other and we can be balanced. And I think that's that's the key going forward. Moving to another branch of government and their connection with the State Department. Um, the current Foreign Service was created in 1924, I believe, um, with the merger of the Diplomatic Service and the Consular Service. It's been 40 years since Congress has written a Foreign Service Act. What role do you think Congress plays in shaping a modern State Department? I think Congress plays a critical role. Uh, I've always looked at our relationship as Congress as being one of partnership. And we talk a lot about partnerships in the department. And again, I think it attracts people who want to be partners with others. Uh, you know, I, when I became the Director General, I made it an I made an effort to go up and start to work with um, with our Congress, even when they weren't looking for us for something, but to try to have that relationship. And what I, what I realized is that as they look at us and they are you know, some of the best uh, students of diplomacy, you know, many of our senators and congressmen and women have been in their positions for many, many years and their staffs even longer. They know us and understand us in a way that perhaps we always don't. And to start that dialogue is really important to really tr to engage with them. And Secretary Blinken has made this a priority. He has said, look, we're going we're gonna to talk to Congress. We're going to talk to them ahead of time. When we have thorny issues that we're having a problem solving, we're going to ask for their advice. We're going to consult. But I also think that um, if you go to Congress often wants to be helpful. I don't know if you ever talk to your congresswoman or, your, or congressman or congresswoman or your senator. They all ask, what do you need? And I think sometimes we were too embarrassed to say that. Mm -hmm. uh, I did. Uh, I did testify last year on uh, be, uh, before the House Foreign Affairs Committee, and I did talk about diversity and inclusion. Uh, but I made a big ask because that I felt is look, you know, we need your help. It's not a an agency on its own. We need your help. And my my ask in that case was to to get some legislative fixes so that we could have paid internships. And it was phenomenal the bipartisan response. I mean, I thought that the, that the the ranking member and the minority, uh, you know, lead, they were practically jumping out of their chairs because they had the same sort of idea. Gee, wouldn't it be great if the State Department came up with something that everybody in Congress could support no matter what your political affiliation was? And I happened to hit on something that they really wanted to do that they've been thinking about. And so we've been working with them on that s since then. And again, this was something personal for me. I came from a family that, um, to be perfectly frank, I don't know if I would have been able uh, to take a summer off and, and move to Washington, D.C. and have my parents pay for housing and, and mm -hmm. not get paid for a summer. I, you know, um, I was supposed to help pay for my college education, which I did. So same. I'm hoping, <laughs> same, exactly. So what I'm hoping is, you know, we're still, I, I can't say too much right now because we're in the process of working with Congress to come up with the bill, but it was amazing how enthused they were that we had something concrete that we needed and we asked for help. So, um, I, you know, this is to me the way it needs to be. I think sometimes people are afraid, but I found that um, there are friends, they want it. They have, you know, just like us, just like the department, just like all of you, 
They want to have the best government in the world. They want us to be the strongest country in the world. They want us to be, you know, the, the country where everybody has as many opportunities as possible. We have a shared vision. So we just have to ask and consult. Wonderful. We kind of keeping with um, relationships with, with Congress a bit. Um, we've heard about, particularly in the previous administration, a purge of senior foreign service officers. Um, we saw several testify during former President Trump's impeachment trial. Um, and it really seemed, particularly with Ambassador Ivanovich and Ambassador McKinley, a real call for the senior foreign service to, to um, speak about principles and kind of why they were taking the positions they were. Um, is this dearth of senior foreign service officers of ambassador rank who can lead the department? Is that true in your experience? Um, and if so, how does the department counter that? Is it, does it mean more political appointees for ambassadors because you need good people to fill those positions? Um, what is, what is the feeling in the, um, kind of, I guess the feeling and the reality from, from your perspective and your role with the senior foreign service right now? So, uh, you know, there were, uh, so people leave the department all the time. I think that what happened during the Trump administration that there were much more public departures than they would have had normally. In fact, people have left the department for many, many years when they have disagreed with policy. And I think this goes back to the Vietnam War. If you were to go back to the seventies, people decided to walk at that time, just think, no social media, no way to, uh, you know, to get this kind of information out to the public. Um, so some people did leave, some people uh, were forced out and some people did leave. Uh, but you know what, the attrition rates for the department are actually nowhere near what you would expect them to be. And um, I asked my team to sort of pull from me, what were the attrition rates last year? So for the foreign service generalists, which is what we're talking about, we talk about ambassadors for the most part, the attrition rate last year was 3.4%. That's actually not even healthy. If you're in private industry, you like to have a little bit of change. Right. So that means people don't really leave. And that was down from 2019. The civil service rate was 6.5%, uh, which was down from 8.2% in 2019. Again, we have a slightly older workforce in the civil service. And when we talk about attrition, it's both resignations and retirements. What I see is that we have a lot of incredibly talented officers that are given great opportunities. There's still a bunch, there are still some people like me that, are, that have been around for a very long time. I think it's important for people like me and others to be mentors and sponsors, to make sure that we give um, diplomats that are rising through the ranks the support they need so that they can do the job to their ability. But a lot of great people stayed who um, continue to, to really uh, have important roles um, one of the other people that testified at the impeachment trial was George Kent. He is still a deputy assistant secretary in the European Bureau. He still continues to work on Ukraine issues, and he opted to stay in um, at that time. So we have people of that caliber who are still with us. And uh, again, I think we saw with the nominations that happened today, those are all people who's, who have been with the department and they are ready uh, for the jobs that they've been nominated for. Thank you for that. And then, you know, I, I'm kind of trying to put my student hat on. When I was a student at Indiana University, very interested in the State Department, um, I thought that you had to be, in order to be effective, in order to persuade, um, not coerce, but persuade, you had to be rigid and firm and not have, you know, the kind of political or uh, the personality behind it. Um, and the most effective foreign servicers, the most effective diplomats I ever met um, were not that way at all. Um, you wanted to know what they thought. You wanted to know what their perspectives were. Um, and connecting with foreign interlocutors is key to, to advancing our interests. Um, and the first question you often get is, but what is your opinion about that? So yeah. can you share a little bit about how diplomats, people in senior roles at the State Department kind of balance the personal opinions and the professional opinions and building those relationships as part of your work? Yeah. Uh, so um, first of all, you know, when you're a diplomat, especially when you're overseas, you are on duty 24 seven. So it's, a, you don't really have that private persona that you have in the United States. That's why we have to come back and serve in DC every once in a while. So, cause you're not always in the limelight. I, I would say that you, um, 
what I've always been able to do is find a path forward, no matter what the policy is in Washington, no matter what political party is in office. And I have worked for both political parties over my career. As I mentioned, I worked um, in the office of three secretaries of state, one, one Democrat and two Republicans. Um, I had great relationships with all three. I learned an incredible amount from all three. So um, sometimes what happens is that uh, it's not a shift in policy. It could be a rebrand. Sometimes mm -hmm. um, what we do, and I'll give you an example. Under the Obama administration, there was a program to really encourage foreign direct investment into the United States. And I forget the name now. Well, when the Trump administration came in, they kept it. They just rebranded it. So everybody thought it was something new and different. I'm like, no, 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 it's the exact same program. It just has a different name. But I also think that uh, we learn to find, you know, those ways that we can uh, work well um, and do the jobs that need to be done. Uh, you know, there is there is a code, though. Um, you know, we do have a dissent channel, by the way, which is something that we've had for for decades. So if you truly have disagree with a policy, you can start a private conversation with um, the leadership of the agency to talk about that. Uh, so we have ways also to express ourselves that's not necessarily directly confrontational. And again, I think as diplomats, we tend not to be directly confrontational. That's not what the job set's looking for. But I do think there are ways that we can continue to do this. Um, and I have to say that throughout my career, I've always found space to work on issues that were important to me and to the institution, to the American people without a problem. And my, my last question before opening it up to um, the other guests, so get your questions ready, um, folks, is uh, would love for you to reflect a little bit um, and then also bring us current. So how has diplomacy changed since you first started your career? Do you think it was more effective in the past? Do you think it's easier now um, with technology and the interconnected way that we all live our lives um, to, to do that kind of work? And where do you see it going? Whether that's the infusion of disruptive technology, whether that's technology in general at the department, um, although I'm sure there's been great advances since I left a couple of years ago. Um, but where, where do you really see that kind of, where has it come? And then also what to you is the future modern State Department? So I, the uh, State Department has changed significantly and I think it's much more complicated. When I joined the Foreign Service, we, we did not have any real technology. We had no way to link. I mean, it, many of you may remember the old Selectric typewriters with the little balls on them that you would have to change if you wanted to change fonts. It was pretty primitive. Uh, so you were, give, you were trained to do a certain type of work and you were sent overseas to do that type of work. Uh, you were given clear instructions from Washington. It was often bilateral issues, not always. Obviously, we had the UN and we had other issues. We had other international organizations, so the issues could sometimes be much broader. But it was not, uh, it was a much more stovepipe, I would say maybe a cylinder of excellence kind of approach. Mm -hmm. Over time, uh, technology, I think, has been one of the biggest changes that we've faced. Uh, but we've also, we've also needed to adapt and give, I think, our diplomats different skills. So it's not just, you know, we, we hire generalists, as I think people know. Um, and oh, if that's done well for me during my career, which is to be good at a whole lot of things, but not very deep, we're finding we need to change that a little bit. We need to give our diplomats some different skills. Um, I think about things like how do we use data? How do we prepare people for things like artificial intelligence? How do we move our discussions beyond the basics of economics to really trying to understand the dynamism of financial markets and financial systems? And it, I find that the, we need to give people more information and more ability to, if they are not the experts themselves, to pull back, the, to get from elsewhere the information they need to be successful. I will say one thing, the pandemic as awful as it's been um, and has allowed us to move to a virtual platform. And one of the things I think we're doing now quite well is leveraging expertise around the world. So if you're in Washington and you have a very complicated issue and the experts living in, uh, in, in Israel, you know, you would have to try to get that person back to come to meetings. We don't do that any longer. We can, we can touch the person who's the expert who can, and, and I really think this is one of the things that I found has been liberating because 
a year ago, I'm not sure any of us would have been comfortable doing this, sitting in front of a laptop and talking to a bunch of little squares on a screen. Now we do it, and now we're able to reach back. Uh, and I'll give you a great example. In Chile, I, uh, we were working on the Chilean government on cybersecurity and cyber defense. Uh, you know, like many countries that are relatively small and democratic and try to be everybody's friend because they are small and democratic, they never thought they'd be at risk for any kind of cyber intrusions. And it became, as they were in the run up to the elections, they were really concerned about actors, malicious actors coming in. And so we started to work with them. You know, at that time, I had to find the right people in the federal government who could help them. And then I had to have them travel down to Chile to do this. And that was hard. And was trying to get, you know, everybody together. That wouldn't happen today. I would be able to call to whether or not I needed somebody at the Department of Justice or I need somebody at the State Department uh, or somebody at the Department of Homeland Security or the CISA branch, I could get those people together. But that means giving our diplomats the skills to really understand how the federal government works, to touch into everything and to make sure that we can do it. I think going forward, um, this challenge is gonna be that we're gonna have to have people that are thinking globally first um, in terms of the issues that face us so that they are well prepared to uh, respond and protect the interests of the United States. And that is gonna be a continuing challenge as our, um, our challenges and our enemies change over time. Thank you so much, Ambassador Rose. I've certainly enjoyed speaking with you, but I also know um, many of my colleagues and friends and some family members um, also, I'm sure, want to ask you questions. So here is your opportunity, friends and family. Um, you can have ask in two ways. You can either um, message me. So if you go to the chat feature, the two, you can drop down to Jillian Turner and send me a message. You then should be able to unmute yourself and ask your question to Ambassador Perez once I call on you. So as the chats come in, um, I see we have one from Bruce. Bruce, please feel free to ask your question to Ambassador Perez. I don't hear him. I don't either. Adibola, would you unmute Bruce? Okay, while Bruce gets ready, Betty also has a question. Betty, please go ahead. Hey, I don't have a question as so much as a statement. Thank you so much. This was really a wonderful, um, like many other people, I think probably on the call, I spent close to 15 years overseas. And I, I have found that one of the hardest things to explain to Americans is why we waste our money on mm -hmm. things overseas. We have so many needs here at home. Mm -hmm. And I think it really has to be a question addressed to the American public because they're gonna to continue to find criticism until they really understand, as you had, you have so well explained this evening, the importance of that investment. And I think when someone like Mattis puts it, you know, if we don't spend money on this, we'll spend money on bullets instead, and we can't do that. So I think perhaps that might be the explanation for people. Um, do you want another war? And right. maybe you'll understand why we make that investment, but it is tough to explain. Thank you so much. It was a wonderful job this evening. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, buddy. Oh, please go ahead, Ambassador Press. No, I was going to say I completely agree. And, you know, we, as I said, our budget is quite small. So uh, I think we're a lot of bang for the buck. I, I don't think we, this is part of the challenge I think we have. Um, we don't necessarily brand ourselves really well. And I hate to use the word brand. I don't want it to be pejorative. But, you know, we do a lot. And we do it, I think, often without a lot of recognition. You know, what's heartwarming is when um, I get a letter from a um, someone somebody in the United States who just feels that they got so much assistance from the department in some way, whether it might be to help uh, you know, export a product overseas or to help a family member, it really touches me. Um, we make sure that we distribute those because it really puts a personal face on this. Um, you know, it's about people, we're all people, we're trying to do the right thing. Um, and as I said, that's why I'm so delighted that I had this opportunity to reconnect. Uh, and I wish, as I said, I wish I could do it in person, but this is, this is, this is good enough. Ray, I believe you have a question as well. Yes, yeah, thank you very much. Uh, I really enjoyed your presentation. Uh, I'm interested in sort of the change in global politics with respect to sort of the uh, increase in the number of authoritarian rulers in around the world, you know, in Hungary and 
Myanmar and, and so forth and Turkey. You know, how, how does this affect the kind of the training that uh, potential uh, State Department employees might have in terms of their approach to these countries? Yeah, and you've raised um, some a, a good example, especially what happened just now in Burma and Myanmar, where we are dealing with the regime change there. Uh, you know, uh, one of the things that I find uh, in my role, where I'm responsible for training and development, uh, we have a we do have levers. We talked a little bit earlier about transactional um, diplomacy. We do have levers, and one of the ones that we use quite a bit is um, sanctions, and that is something that I think we. I think we need more expertise in the department. I, need, I think we need people who really understand, understand what a sanction regime looks like. What does that mean? Um, and also when it's appropriate to do that. Uh, the other thing I would say is that in Burma, just like in many other countries, it's the coalition of countries that we hope will help facilitate change. So being able to, walk, to work across um, various organizations is very, very important. Uh, we spend a lot of time, we have a Foreign Service Institute, which is our training, our training platform. Um, and we do, the, the biggest part of that is language training, but we also do area studies. We do uh, training on specific types of, uh, you know, occupations or I, I guess with, you know, training that is much more practical. Uh, but this trade craft, it's really about teaching our diplomats the trade craft of how do you, what again, what's available to you? How do you use it? When do you use it? With whom do you use it? Um, and we've done expansions of our tradecraft training in the last couple of years. Uh, Ambassador Dan Smith, who until just yesterday was the acting deputy secretary of state and briefly was the acting secretary, was the director of the Foreign Service Institute for a couple of years. And that's one of the things that he focused on was this tradecraft, because it gets to the point that there's not one thing that you need to do, you have to try many. And to your point, it gets very complicated when the value set of the country that we're dealing with is completely different than ours. And so that tradecraft and trying to teach our diplomats what to use becomes increasingly important. When you, when you talk about that, is there a role for private industry to play? Or is that training that's housed within FSI and that the department is really um, working on training one another? So the majority of the training does take place in Washington D.C., but not all of it. One of the thing, one of the uh, the programs that we've been looking at, and I have not yet had an opportunity to talk with Secretary Blinken about this, and in, in the short time that he's been in the department, is to do more exchanges. One of the programs that I think we've done in smallish numbers over the years is to send our diplomats. Um, either to Congress or to companies to have exchanges. We, we've had programs, they're relatively small, but we, are, we, you know, we need to look at how we might increase these because I do think it makes a difference. I just had a group of mid-career mid employees uh, pitch me and some others on IDEA last week that they would like to put a, uh, an FSO in every state. And that person would be the liaison to the State Department with, with state operations. It's a brilliant idea. I, again, I, I, we need to socialize this. They just came and pitched me on it. It was a brilliant idea. It came from the mid ranks. Again, how do we connect better? How do we make sure that what we're doing really aligns? So somebody who would intimately know what's important to people from Indiana. I think that would, you know, it's a great idea. Uh, but again, it's something that we, uh, you know, I, I haven't had a chance to talk to the secretary about yet and something that we'll want to consider. Bruce, do you have a question? You should be able to unmute yourself, Bruce. All right, sorry, Ambassador, we have already informally met a couple of days ago, sorry. Anyway, uh, you had, uh, I was just curious how the State Department felt during our last president's impeachment trial as Fiona Hill and Colonel Vindman testified. For me, they made such a huge positive impression of who was representing the country internationally that uh, it was tremendous positive PR for the State Department. I was just wondering, how did the State Department feel? How did you feel during that process? So, you know, um... 
you know, first of all, the impeachment process, which was very tough for many um, FSOs in particular, Foreign Service officers in particular, uh, and I knew um, Ambassador Yovanovitch very well personally, and so you know, this it becomes very, very complicated. Well, there were a couple reactions. I think first of all, it put. I think people understood what the State Department does more than they ever had in the past, right? I think yes. again, people don't understand what we do. I talked to a. To your point, I was. Um, about six months after the impeachment trial, I went to Pakistan uh, uh, to visit uh, the embassy and I was having lunch with a brand new foreign service officer, somebody on his first tour. And I asked him what he thought. I said, you're brand new to this. And he said, you know, people understand and they appreciate what we do and they have respect for what we do. And he found that rather than be something that was um, inhibiting people from applying, he said people want to come because they now know what impact they can make. So I think at the end of the day, what we have to realize is we take an oath to the Constitution. I think that came up in those hearings. Mm -hmm. It's not to a president. It's not to a political party. Again, I work for both and I've, I and I've respected many, um, you know, the, many of the people that I, I mean, the people that I've worked with. It's that oath to the Constitution that drives us, that, that it's to public service. Um, and I, I think that um, in some respects, the professionalism that they showed was a good reflection on what we uh, as diplomats and also, um, you know, a, we had, a, we had a, an officer from DOD and Fiona Hill was at the NSC at the time. We all try to do to the best of our abilities, our jobs, because that's because we took that oath of office. Uh, and um, I think it was just a, a moment to reflect on what we, what we signed up for when we, we signed up for it. I don't know about Jillian, but you know, it is a very emotional moment when you do it. You don't get to do it often enough in your career, by the way. We do it when we join. We swear an oath of office when we join. Mm -hmm. You do it when you become an ambassador. Um, when I became the director general and a presidential appointment, I did it. We're now doing it for anyone who becomes a senior officer. We ask them to restate the oath of office just to remind them why they are there and why this is so important. Uh, so th it's a great question. And I do think it actually, in some respects, gave the, uh, the American people a better sense of who we are and what we do. It made me very proud. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. I agree. I think about that often, particularly the line protecting against enemies, both foreign and domestic. Um, I never thought about the domestic part so much as I, you know, have over, over the past several months thinking about what that means, you know, really to, um, to hold that oath. Um, so thank you for that. Um, one other, we have many questions coming in. Um, so apologies to, to folks in advance if we're not able to, um, to get to everyone. I do would like to have an opportunity for a student to ask a question. Um, so Kate Lee. Hi, Ambassador Prez. Um, my name is Kate Lee. I'm a student at IU. Um, and I was um, curious, given um, President Biden and Secretary Blinken's focus on um, the State Department and the interruption that COVID has had in the interviewing and testing process, do you foresee a possible increase in hiring and scheduling A100s in the coming year to make up for um, staffing levels um, at the current time? Yeah, so last year was a pretty awful year. Uh, the, for those who took the Foreign Service written test, uh, Pearson View, who is our partner, closed because they didn't quite know how to do proctored tests in a virtual environment. That was you, I'm so sorry <laughs> that happened. And then once they figured it out, which took about six months, uh, then we started to slowly uh, bring people in for the oral interviews, the in-person interviews. We were able to do to come up with a virtual platform and we used it sparingly because it was just so complicated to do. Ironically, by the time we got this all figured out, it was like October, November, we started gang, the gangbusters, meaning you know social distance according to DC rules and regulations. Um, health, health considerations. And then we had a huge surge in COVID cases in the Washington DC area that started right around Thanksgiving and continued through January, which shut us down again. So um, the good news is that the board of examiners is back up and running and they are doing that very much social distance. We had to change everything. You will now have tests that 
are in rooms with um, that are almost as like half the size of a football field and everybody's social distance, but we are doing it. The exams are back well, as I said, Pearson View has figured out how to do those. And the numbers of diplomats taking the tests are up. So we have, uh, we have some ground to recapture, but we're hoping to do that. But the other good news is that there is a bump up for both foreign and civil service in the president's discretionary budget. So if that gets through, that will even be better news because it's not just gonna be about, you know, the fact that our pipeline sort of slowed down a little bit, but we'll be able to hire more people. So I'm hopeful that we will get that through Congress and that will be good news for starting in, starting in October 1st in fiscal, for the fiscal 2022 budget. Wonderful. Thank you, and Ambassador Perez. Um, before you joined, uh, Lou Fenter walked us through kind of the structure of the State Department, how um, the career uh, foreign service officers and civil service work with um, foreign service nationals to inform policy and generalists and why generalists can solve complex problems and all of those things. So um, we were able to address that a little bit more in, in the beginning. Um, I think with that, it's it's time for us to wrap up today's presentation. Um, Larry, over to you. Yes, uh, thank you, Jillian. Thank you, Ambassador Perez, for sharing your evening with us. Uh, so glad we finally got you <laughs> connected to the program. We're lucky we had the... Uh, uh, someone in the wings and Lou Finter did a great job at kind of setting the stage before you before you came on board. Um, I think our technical blips kind of pale in relation to the kinds of issues that our diplomats face, but uh, thanks for your patience and your flexibility and glad they had the chance to have uh, uh, Lou Finter <laughs> jump in in the wings. I'm sure there are people in the audience who see themselves up to the challenges which, you've, uh, uh, which you have uh, described. So if anyone's interested in learning more about uh, careers in the Foreign Service, you'll find Diplomat in Residence uh, Lou Finter's contact information in the, in the chat box there. Feel free to contact him. Now, next Tuesday, April 20th, we return to our winter weekly Great Decision series with the focus on Brexit and European Union featuring Dr. John McCormick. And you can learn more about uh, uh, the programs and how to sign up for them at our ICWA website. Uh, we wrap up our Distinguished Speaker season uh, next month with another outstanding speaker and uh, an A-list speaker again. On Thursday, May 13, Ambassador Bill Brownfield will join us from Washington, <laughs> D.C. <laughs> Someone that I know that Ambassador Perez knows well. They both were posted to Chile as uh, ambassador at different times. And he's going to talk to us about Latin America and the opportunities and challenges facing President Joe Biden from uh, that region. Ambassador Brownfield served sequentially as U.S. Ambassador to Chile, Venezuela, and Colombia among other assignments in his long and distinguished foreign service career. You can find more information on all of our programs on our Indiana Council on World Affairs website. That's at indianaworld.org. So for now, on behalf of the Indiana Larry, Council on World Larry, Affairs. Larry, yes. I want to add, um, on Tuesday evening, I speak on behalf of the Great Decisions Committee. We want to emphasize, as Larry said, that is our last program for the program series year. And to end it, we're adding a special feature, which we hope will entice you to think about coming. We're having what is called a nightcap. The program starts at seven and we'll, and we'll do a hard stop at 8.30 with questions because we all want to ask you to, to please stay on with us. Go to your lager and take your favorite beverage and a snack, whatever that might be, come back and join us. And Ambassador, you might want to come as well. Sounds like a great idea. <laughs> Going to just have an informal, it will not be speaker led, though the speaker we stayed with us, but we're going to have an informal just chit chat. And it's going to be maybe Brexit, maybe something else throughout the year, just it'll probably be global. And we'll go on for, you know, 45 minutes or so in, in, in our virtual pub. And we want you to come and join us. And that's how we're going to end the year uh, with our nightcap. So we hope that you join us, but you have to register. And thanks, Betty. Yeah, that, that'll be good. So please, please uh, join us if you can, everyone. So now on behalf of the Indiana Council on World Affairs, I want to thank our distinguished speaker, Ambassador Carol Perez, our moderator, Jillian Turner, Diplomat in residence, Louis Finter, Ambassador Perez's staff from Washington office, the Lourdes Quay and Tricia Wingerter, our former board member and current honorary vice consul for Italy, Zeno Tutino, who had worked with Ambassador Perez in the US consulate in Milan, Italy, and who put us in touch with, uh, with her, 
Adebola Ogundipe, who is our technical host, and all of you who joined us this evening. Ambassador Perez, do you want to say a final word of farewell to the group? Well, again, thank you so much for this um, for this invitation, and Larry and, and Jillian. I, I really appreciate it. I'm very sorry we had some technical difficulties. So just think about what a small world it is. You mentioned Zeno Chitina, who I served in Milan with well over uh, about a dozen years ago. That connectivity still exists today. It shows you we're very small. It shows you why diplomacy is still so relevant. And I also will say, I am glad I spoke be before Ambassador Brownfield. He is a friend, a colleague, a former boss, and he is the funniest man alive. And so <laughs> you should show up because you will be laughing hysterically during his remarks. So I'm glad I went first and I didn't have to come after him. <laughs> well, he said he was going to try to join us this evening. He had a family uh, issue that kept him from it, but he, he was going to say a few comments about you. Actually, quite good. He said that you really <laughs> kept the wheels on the wagon at the Foreign Service in the last few years, and he really appreciates what you've done. So with that, thank you again. Thank you so much. Good evening, and hope to see you all again soon. So thank good night, you. everyone. Okay, yeah, good thanks. night. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.